Yeah, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We have a, a session on the occasion of the 100th uh, anniversary of uh, Mises' publication, Nation, State and uh, Economy, a book uh, published under a German title in 1919. We'll have a few other uh, opportunities uh, during the next few years to have anniversaries of, the, of a similar sort because Mises published quite a few books during the 1920s, so we'll do this regularly from now on. And then there, of course, there are other anniversaries that are of the 50-year sort and of the 75 years or so, so you do the math, there are quite a few things to come. Well, so Nation, State, and Economy was written uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War I. Uh, so uh, Germany and Austria had, had, had lost the war. Uh, Mises writes this book while the peace negotiations in uh, Saint-Germain and uh, Versailles were still uh, in process. Uh, he writes this while the Austrian Empire had collapsed, so there was a secession of all non-German speaking, non -German -speaking uh, parts of the empire, so Austria was a, a very small dwarf state, or had become a dwarf state. And so Mises, um, that in this book, uh, tries to analyze the causes that led to World War I, the causes that led to the defeat of the Axis powers, and he focuses uh, very largely on uh, the conditions that prevailed in Germany and in Austria. So we don't have an international uh, comparative uh, uh, approach, which is certainly a limitation of the book. Um, uh, Keynes, also in his book that was published about the same time, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, focused also on the conditions that prevailed in, in Britain and in France. He neglected a little bit the, the conditions in, uh, in Germany and in Austria, which is good custom to focus, do one's own homework first before, before looking at the, the errors or the omissions and so on of the others. So uh, Mises' thesis was that the war resulted most notably from German imperialism. So in the book, he tries to come to grips with uh, the nature, uh, causes, uh, and causes of, of imperialism. Uh, and so the book is structured in in three uh, chapters or three parts. One, uh, the first part actually occupies almost two thirds of the book, um, uh, uh, in which he deals with the concepts of nation and state, uh, w which is really a theory of imperialism. And the second uh, part then deals with war socialism. And the third part with uh, the history of the Social Democratic Party uh, in Germany. Uh, the book has not been published again in, in German, at least to my knowledge. Um, the English or the American edition has appeared in 1983 with an introduction by, uh, so it's been translated and introduced by uh, Leland Jaeger, uh, so was a professor at the University of Virginia and then at Auburn University and uh, deceased uh, last year, so has been a, a great fellow traveler for, for many years. Today we have a, a distinguished panel, uh, so I'm greeting uh, Professor Di Lorenzo, uh, Dr. Nikola Gatchev and uh, Professor Salerno. Uh, and myself will also present uh, a paper. Uh, we'll uh, start with uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Di Lorenzo, so we'll proceed in this order, then Gurdjieff, then Salerno, and then, then Hulsmann. Each of us will have 15 minutes for presentation, and I'll watch with German jealousy on this. So it's not just because we, it's not because we lost the First World War, I mean, even the second, that we cannot read the, the, the times anymore, right? So uh, watch this, and then at the end we'll have, uh, uh, hopefully, enough time for discussion. Okay, Guido asked me, uh, gave me an interesting uh, topic. He asked me to... Uh, read through a nation, state, and economy, and, and, uh, and say something about the extent to which it applies to U.S. history, because it's all about uh, European history, the German, you know, the Prussian Empire, and so forth. And so that's what I did. I, I got kind of it's very interesting to me to, to think about that, since I've written about U.S. history, and uh, you know, in the context of what Mises had to say about imperialism. So I just sat down. I ended up writing a 37-page paper about it. And I'm going to stand here and read every word right now. But I'll just, some of the highlights. Uh, uh, here's one quote uh, it's at, I put at the top of the paper. And the theme, by the way, is that the, the uh, sources of imperial, German imperialism that Mises wrote about, I'm going to argue, were already cultivated in the, in the United States before in Germany. And, uh, and so I think, I think you know, the United States was already even more imperialistic than Germany was by the time you get to the World War I era. And here's what Mises said, and he may probably would agree with me. He said, these imperialistic doctrines are common to all peoples today. Imagine that, not just Germans. 
Englishmen, Frenchmen, and Americans who marched off to fight imperialism in World War I are no less imperialistic than the Germans. And that's sort of one of the themes of, of one of the, of the chapters. You know, so I'm going to read just a couple of short uh, uh, quotes. He said, the Prussian Empire uh, had, quote, had not arisen from the will of the German people. It was a state of German princes, but not of the German people. Okay, he said the German people sort of ac acquiesced in this, the Prussian Empire, as long as there was uh, sufficient, he used the word sufficient, prosperity and military pomp. And he said, but the prosperity had nothing to do, I'm quoting, had nothing to do with the political and military successes of the German state. And then accompanying that was uh, uh, a sort of a, a propaganda crusade against classical liberalism, uh, essentially a prerequisite. And he says this, to the status school of economic policy, an economy left to its own devices appears as a wild chaos into which only state intervention can bring order. He said, the state, on the other hand, is described as all wise and all just and always wishes only the common good and has the power to fight against all evils effectively. And that's, that's the, uh, uh, the attitude that, that, he, that he's writing about. And then he goes on to say, for all the difficulties that confronted the German people at home and abroad, the military solution was always recommended. Only ruthless use of power was considered rational policy. Okay, and, and he distinguishes between what he calls the princely state and the free state. And the princely state uh, lives by this, the more land, the more subjects, the more revenue, and the more soldiers. Only in the size of the state does assurance of its preservation lie. Smaller states are always in danger of being swallowed up by larger ones. And then by contrast, a free state, there are no conquests, no annexations, and it forces no one against his will into the structure of the state. And he makes the case for secession here also. He says, when a part of a people of the state wants to drop out of the union, liberalism, that is classical liberalism, does not hinder it from doing so. Colonies that, went, uh, that want to become independent need only to do so in, in the free state. And so th that's how he lays out his, his argument here about the princely state versus the, uh, the free state. And the princely state, of course, is the one that leads to imperialism, which only, in bene which only benefits the elite, the ruling class, uh, at the expense of everybody else. And so what I do, uh, the first thing I do in, uh, in my paper about uh, how this might apply to U.S. history is uh, to compare the, the Jeffersonian uh, attitude toward secession. Uh, you know, no, no people should be forced into the structure of the state to the nationalist uh, version. You know, in American history, we had the, the nationalist tradition, uh, and Alexander Hamilton is most closely associated with that. Hamilton, Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln, and, and their political descendants, and then the Jeffersonian decentralist tradition. And to give you two examples, you know, in, in Jefferson's first inaugural address, he said this, if, any, if, if there any, be any among us who would wish to dissolve the Union, let them stand undeserved, undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left to combat it. Uh, he also wrote a letter years later, years later, a couple of years later, to a, to a man that, that asked him about the New England secession movement. The New Englanders were plotting to secede after Jefferson was elected. They actually held a secession convention in Hartford, Connecticut in 1814. And Jefferson said this, if there is to be a separation, then God bless them both, that is both sections or confederacies, and keep them in the union if it be for their good, but separate them if it be better. So that was his attitude. He was a lifelong advocate of secession. And you compare that uh, as Murray Rothbard once said, by the way, he said, the central government was not supposed to be perpetual. Does anyone seriously believe for one minute that any of the 13 states would have ratified the Constitution had they believed it was a perpetual one, a one-way Venus flytrap, a one-way <laughs> ticket to sovereign suicide? That, that was how Murray Rothbard <laughs> put it, a Venus flytrap, you know, <laughs> okay, no, no escape. And of course, you know, contrast that with the nationalist tradition when you get to Lincoln. He says this, no state can lawfully get out of the union and acts against the authority of the United States are insurrection insurrectionary 
or revolutionary. And uh, in his first inaugural address, he argued that the, U the union of the states created the states. It wasn't the other way around. The states did not create the union. And the late Joe Sobrin once said that, uh, well, that uh, makes as much sense as saying uh, a marriage can be older than either spouse. Uh, you know, a union of two things cannot be older than the things themselves. But that was Lincoln's argument for invading the southern states, uh, never, nevertheless. So, so and, and of course, uh, in his first inaugural address, he bent over backwards to defend sla southern slavery. He had no intention to do anything about southern slavery. He even uh, 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 defended the Corwin Amendment to the Constitution in that speech, which would have prohibited the government from ever interfering with slavery. But on tax collection, he was uncompromising. He said there will be bloodshed and invasion. Those are the words he used of any state that failed to collect the tariff tax, which had just been more than doubled two days earlier. President Buchanan signed into, uh, the moral tariff into law two days earlier. So on tax collection, there would be no compromise. You know, more land, more subjects, more soldiers, more revenues. Another uh, comment that I found interesting that Mises made, and, uh, and this, by the way, uh, you know, Guido mentioned that uh, John Maynard Keynes' famous book, uh, the, the Economic Consequences of the Peace, was published around the same time. So was War is the Health of the State by Randolph Bourne. Uh, we, within months of, of, of um, this book being published, and, and a lot of you are familiar with that. But another of Mises' claims is that he says the Marxists of his day were all for a freedom of the press, quote, as long as they were not the ruling party. But once in power, they did nothing more quickly than set these freedoms aside. And of course, that immediately reminded me of American history because the, uh, the Federalist Party, many of the same people who, who uh, who signed off on the, the Bill of Rights to the United States Constitution and supported the Bill of Rights, as soon as they got in power, abolished the First Amendment with the Sedition Act, making a criticism of the Adams administration illegal. Even a member of Congress named Matthew Lyon from Vermont was imprisoned because he described the Adams administration as, quote, filled with ridiculous pomp and foolish adulation of John Adams. And for that, he was imprisoned and forced to walk barefoot through his hometown. And, uh, and so they outlawed uh, free political speech. And of course, Lincoln was the, uh, the, the, the best example of this, of taking an oath, a solemn oath, to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States, and then turning around the day later, uh, almost, and uh, suspending the writ of habeas corpus, mass arresting tens of thousands of northern political opponents, shutting down over 300 opposition newspapers, deporting Congressman Belandigan, confiscating firearms in, in, the, in the border states, and, and generally uh, uh, censoring the newspapers, and generally abolishing civil liberties altogether. You fast forward to the World War I period, the 1918 Sedition Act, uh, outlawed, quote, interfering with the war effort. You couldn't interfere with the war effort. Over a thousand prosecutions with prison sentences up to 20 years uh, were handed out uh, during that time. And so uh, that's another example. Then, of course, during World War II, the rounding up of 100,000 Japanese Americans and forcing them into concentration camps was not uh, really in keeping with civil liberties either by Roosevelt, who also took the exact same oath to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States. And of course, if you fast forward to today, the American Civil Liberties Union has been one of the biggest enemies of civil liberties because they support all these campus speech codes and, and, uh, and the political uh, correctness gone wild in, uh, in our society in, in the United States. I have another section called American Wars of Conquest, because that, after all, is a big part of what Mises wrote about uh, when he refers to you know, the Prussian Empire and, and, uh, and German militarism. Uh, the War of 1812, the War of 1812, you know, seven, the distance between 1789 and 1812 is not a big, long period of history. Okay, Why was there a War of 1812? Well, you can find... Congre congressional statements explaining uh, members of Congress why, what they hoped to gain by the War of 1812 by invading Canada. Congressman Richard Johnson said, I shall never die contented until I see England's expulsion from North America and her territories incorporated into the United States. Congressman John Harper said, 
The author of Nature himself has marked our limit in the south by the Gulf of Mexico and on the north by the regions of in eternal frost. So the North, the, the North Pole to South America, okay. A, a military general, Alexander Smith, before he led his troops into war to invade Canadians, uh, which I call Canukistan, by the way, it's like, uh, Canada. Uh, uh, he said, said this to the troops, you will enter a country that is to become one of the United States. So they fully expected uh, Canada to be the, you know, an extra state. Uh, there's a historian named Elliot Cohen who wrote a book, Conquered into Liberty. That's a, kind of a neat title, isn't it? <laughs> Conquered into Liberty. Uh, and he said that if the conquest of Canada was not an objective at the start of the war, it soon became an objective at the start of the war. And of course, the, uh, what I call the war to prevent Southern independence was nothing if not a war of conquest. Uh, you know, if you look up the dictionary definition of uh, wars of conquest, they involve subjugation, plunder, cultural dominance by the victors, and in some cases, genocide. And I would argue that every one of these things happened to the southern states uh, during and after the uh, the war. And this morning, Brian McClanahan gave a talk, uh, mentioned the uh, the cultural, what you might call cultural genocide of the South, in uh, in his talk. Then, right after the 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 war, uh, was the Indian Wars. General Sherman himself, three months after the American Civil War ended, was put in charge of the military district of the Missouri. The, the, the U.S. government separated the country into uh, five different military districts, and his job was basically to wage a campaign of genocide against Plain, Plains Indians. And Sherman himself gave the reason for this. Here's what he said. We are not going to let a few thieving, ragged Indians check and stop the progress of the railroads. So they, a, so they sort of socialized the cost of building the transcontinental railroads uh, through, through Indian territory, uh, in contrast to James J. Hill, the private entrepreneur who built the privately funded Great Northern Railroad without any subsidies, and he paid the Indians for rights of way with cattle, money, whatever they could trade for. He, did, he didn't have the ability to call in the army to mass murder the Indians, uh, as, as the U.S. government did. Uh, I have another section called American Wars Against, quote, the Lower Races. Mises commented how uh, for, for quite a long time, the Prussians and, and, the, and the German militarists waged war against people of what he called the lower races. And he's, he's sort of mocking them because they, they call these people the lower races. Why did they call them the lower races? Because there are people who are supposedly, quote, not ready for self-government and never will be ready. Therefore, we need to conquer them and, and govern them. Was the, was the argument. And this also reminded me a lot of Sherman uh, uh, and the Indian Wars in America. Uh, he said this, there's one quote from Sherman, the Indians give a fair illustration of the fate of the Negroes if they are released from the control of the white people. That's General Sherman. Uh, and his biographer, Michael Fellman, said that uh, the whole Indian Wars, which lasted for 30 years, uh, the objective was what he called, quote, a racial cleansing of the land. Sherman actually used the phrase, the final solution to the Indian problem in, in talking about this. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, the Filipinos, how American imperialists treated the Filipinos at the end of the 19th century when uh, the Spanish Empire was finally kicked out and the American Empire stepped right in. You know, you know they, they assisted kicking out the Spanish Empire. And the Filipinos did not want to be a part of the American Empire. They had just kicked out the Spanish Empire. And so uh, we ended up killing, uh, not we, but they ended up killing some 200,000 Filipinos. Although there are some books, some uh, historians that say it might have been a million. It might have been as many as a million uh, Filipinos. Uh, and, uh, and, and in order to justify this, of course, they had to be dehumanized. Uh, you had uh, Teddy Roosevelt calling them Chinese half-breeds, savages, barbarians, wild and ignorant people, a lesser race. Senator, U.S. Senator Albert Beveridge of Indiana said the Philippines are ours forever and the Pacific Ocean is ours. It's America's duty to, to bring Christianity and civilization to savage and senile peoples. And uh, the Filipinos had been Catholics for, what, 200 years at, the, at, the, at, that, at that point. You know, senile people. And then Teddy said, uh, all the great masterful races have been warlike races. Maybe Hitler got that master race thing from Teddy Roosevelt. I don't know. It came later. Uh, he, he, 
Teddy Roosevelt denounced what he called, quote, the menace of peace, and afterwards he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> I also quote the great William Graham Sumner, who, who, uh, who wrote about this, his famous essay, the, the Conquest of America by Spain, and he pointed out that, you know, and this is, you know, 18, the turn of the, before the turn of the century, and he said, the new, we have a new, new foreign policy now because of this, War, debt, taxation, the diplomacy, a grand governmental system, pomp, glory, a big army and navy, lavish expenditures, political jobbery, in a word, imperialism. So that was the new American imperialism. I'll talk about the sub subjugation of Hawaii also. American businessmen got, businessmen got the, uh, the U.S. envoy, John Stevens, to bring troops to Hawaii and they forced the king of Hawaii to sign what they called the bayonet constitution. You know, either, either sign this or we will gut you with a bayonet, is, is what they were saying. And it basically disenfranchised all the Hawaiians and allowed, gave voting rights to, to wealthy American business, uh, businessmen in, who were in Hawaii at the time and their supporters. And that was their plan. But then something, uh, something happened to foil the plan. Grover Cleveland got elected president and he nixed it, so he didn't allow this to happen. So they thought they, it happened a few years after that, but he nixed it. Teddy Roosevelt, of course, was very upset at this, that they didn't take over Hawaii. And he said this, uh, did Teddy Roosevelt, I feel that it was a crime against the white race that we did not annex Hawaii three years ago. He told a Boston audience uh, that. Uh, I have another section called the American Unified State. Uh, Mises argues that uh, the, the, the German uh, wars against uh, the lower races was one thing, but when, they, when the German militarism was targeted against the white races in Europe, they had to come up with a, new, a theory or a justification for that. It was no longer they are incapable of governing themselves. They need us to govern them. So they, they came up with the theory of the unified state. We need to impose the unified state. There's too much chaos with, uh, with all this uh, uh, you know, decentralization. Okay. And, uh, and so, of course, I make the case that uh, the unified state uh, was, you know, came, came first in America. It's the nationalist tradition, the Lincoln tradition. I'm, I'm about out of time. Uh, Guido's over there and making funny faces. So the final, the final section of my uh, uh, paper uh, is, says Mises was right. Uh, to quote Robert Heilbrunner in that famous article and after the collapse of communism, he, Mises was right uh, about when he said that uh, the, 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 what, I'm, what I have to say about imperialism applies to the Americans, the French, and the British who entered World War I, as well as the Germans. It wasn't just the Germans that should be held responsible for that. And I argue that uh, we got there first before the Germans did. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Many thanks to Professor Hilsman for inviting me indeed to this uh, quite prestigious uh, uh, panel. The title of my talk is Monetary Imperialism, an extension of uh, Mises' uh, theory of international conflict. Uh, so I will first present everything in a nutshell because apparently we uh, have a restraint on time and then I will try to elaborate. Uh, the broad idea is to, to show that there are uh, other sources of imperialism than those that uh, uh, Mises develops in his book and mainly uh, state control over uh, the money supply. And in a situation of uh, several um, uh, state-controlled uh, fiat money producers, naturally emerges uh, a tendency uh, towards unification and centralization. Uh, and this tendency is what I would like to, uh, to show you now. Now, uh, uh, Mises' um, book is uh, quite an achievement because in many respects it uh, contains all the elements of the future praxeology that he will develop. Uh, and one general uh, idea that I would like to, to emphasize is uh, that uh, causal re regularities um, and not power politics govern social relations. 
Uh, this is a very strong point uh, uh, in the book, and uh, Mises uses this point in order to criticize the previous theories of imperialism from the end of the 20, uh, 19th century and the early Marxist theories, according to which imperialism was uh, due um, to some malfunctioning of the capitalist economy. Joseph Schumpeter tried uh, to save uh, capitalism, but his analysis was to some extent also a bit uh, deficient uh, because his explanation was equally deterministic. Schumpeter did not manage to explain why individuals from some point of time preferred to cooperate together and to move from the energy for war to the energy uh, for labor. And Mises, uh, in his uh, a genius, uh, provided precisely that rational explanation based on the capacity of uh, uh, individuals to, uh, to understand the harmony of the rightly uh, understood interests. So uh, based on that starting point, uh, Mises uh, really saved capitalism from the accusation of being imperialist. And uh, uh, he's really putting the emphasis on, on private property. Quote, quote, ownership turns the fighting man into the economic man. Yeah? Uh, so thanks to reason, people are capable of understanding that there is a mutual harmony between their uh, interests. Uh, and on these precisely firm grounds, Mises identified two major causes uh, for international conflict. Uh, uh, first, the social organization itself might be uh, flawed uh, by design in the sense that uh, it entails uh, a conflict. So these would be material causes for uh, 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 international uh, conflict. And second, individuals might err in their, uh, in their minds and fail to see what is to their true benefit. And Mises applies this very, uh, very consistently uh, in the book. Uh, he refers to, to the law of um, uh, relative overpopulation uh, of some regions, uh, which implies that uh, uh, population migrations uh, will be caused by the attraction of higher, relatively higher uh, relative incomes in regions which are relatively underpopulated. But as a matter of fact, this law is just a specific case application of the general law of scarcity, according to which factors of production are always put to their best use. And this law operates both uh, in a capitalist economy and uh, in a socialist economy. So uh, in the event of a capitalist economy, uh, since people are moving, then uh, the real culprit uh, for uh, international uh, conflict would be uh, the democratic regime, uh, because by definition there will be a national minority. And let me stress here that Mises uh, has a very individualistic uh, understanding of uh, a national, uh, national freedom, which he defines really based on individual freedom from state and society. Yeah, the, true, the only true national autonomy is the freedom of the individual against the state and society. And then the second material cause of international conflict is rooted really in the commonwealth of the socialist nations where uh, the law for the best uh, uh, use of resources uh, still prevails. But as uh, uh, nation states have monopolized resources, then the only solution to achieve this best use is to annex uh, to integrate foreign economic uh, uh, territories. Uh, so Mises' uh, explanation of national conflicts and of imperialism is truly rooted in the analysis of collectivism, uh, be it in its material aspects or in its ideological aspects. However, he does admit a plurality of uh, direct uh, driving factors. Towards the end of, of his book, Mises states that imperialism could flourish even within the social order of private property. Quote, he who rules the means of exchange of ideas and of goods in the economy based on the division of labor has his rule more firmly grounded than ever an imperator before. And leaving aside ideology-driven uh, imperialism, which quite obviously is very important nowadays in a world of global warming and other uh, sources of sustainable development, I would like now to expand on this uh, other a source of uh, imperialism, of a driving force, which is the state control over the means of exchange of goods. So to set the stage, uh, let me take for granted the Austrian explanation of the nature and origin of the modern uh, two-tier banking systems. 
In these uh, systems, central banks produce legal tender money and act as lenders of last resort for commercial banks that expand credit by lending fiduciary media of exchange, which they themselves produce in the form of deposits. And it was through a process of devolution of money and credit, as uh, put by Professor Hoppe, and which Professor Salerno also has labeled uh, the, regression the, yes, the regression theorem, uh, that uh, money substitutes uh, that are titles initially convertible into commodity money produced within the market have been progressively transformed into fiat uh, paper or electronic monies produced outside the market. So what can, uh, can we say about the relations between these state-controlled fiat uh, money producers? To begin with, and borrowing the expression from Rothbard, whoever enjoys a monopoly of fiat money production can consume without the need to produce. So by expanding the money supply, which is practically costless, the money producer and his agents can attract part of the output of the economy without any productive effort. They engage in a systematic expropriation or specifically monetary, monetary exploitation in this case. In particular, the concrete institutional arrangements of producing and distributing money nowadays tend to blur the identity of the exploiters. Nevertheless, we can point out to three broad groups of beneficiaries. First, the banking industry itself, which has a new source of income, which on top is protected by government regulations. Second, uh, borrowers benefit from uh, cheaper credit, and this ensures a widespread support for modern banking, which is therefore seen as a source of economic prosperity, which indeed, to some extent, in the short term, it is for those who secure uh, uh, the credits from the banks. And third, within the group of borrowers, modern states stand out as the primary and systematic beneficiary of monetary exploitation. The special status of public debt instruments, which are the de facto prerequisites for accessing the lender of last resort, implies that most of any monetary expansion reaches first the state. And in itself, this explains already the multitude of state-enforced legal tender uh, 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 paper money uh, monopolies. Now, the fundamental problem uh, in this system is that these monopolies uh, over fiat uh, money production do not lead to territorial exclusiveness. International exchanges imply that the use of a foreign money must be admitted for some part of the exchanges that residents do, namely the exchanges with foreigners. Foreign money producers, therefore, owe each other mutual recognition, without which international exchanges in the present-day monetary system would not be possible. And that recognition implies that they must accept to buy and sell foreign monies against their own money. In other words, any fiat money producer must accept that his territorial monopoly is to some extent permanently encroached by foreign rivals. Therefore, in such a system, conflict is the natural state. Referring to the international dimension of the famous Cantillon uh, effects, we can understand that each fiat money producer would seek to ensure that his money is permanently held abroad uh, as an international reserve currency. First, this uh, would increase the demand for it, which would support its purchasing power, and therefore increase the real value of monetary exploitation. And second, de facto, this would enlarge the economic theory on which uh, uh, he is practicing uh, uh, monetary exploitation. So the natural conflict between uh, fiat money producers uh, results, therefore, in asymmetric uh, relations. Uh, dominant uh, money producers issue international currencies that are held in reserves by the dominated money producers. And Professor Hoppe uh, has already characteristically labeled uh, this system of a twofold uh, exploitation, monetary imperialism. However, conflict does not end with the rise of a few dominant uh, fiat money producers. Lack of exclusiveness, which questions the effectiveness of, uh, of the monopoly, remains a problem. In addition, perceptions about money's relative qualities as revealed in foreign exchange rate movements restrain uh, monetary exploitation. 
This explains why fiat money producers strive to unify the quality of their respective monies uh, through international cooperation or uh, uh, by imposing fixed exchange rates. The latter, however, are a notoriously unstable solution, uh, not the least because they tend to limit uh, monetary exploitation, while uh, fiat money producers' problems is the precise contrary, namely how to find a way to get it facilitated. So the continuous conflicts uh, between uh, fiat money producers set up a tendency uh, which by elimination and unification reduces uh, their number. And this monetary imperialism owes its success, above all, we must recognize, to the legitimate expectations it creates within annexed economic areas for gaining access to a money of a initially better quality. First of all, the successful imperialist money producer uh, is the one that has been less inflationary so far. Huh? All the others have been eliminated uh, because of overexpansion of the money supply. The de facto increased demand for the international currency also objectively strengthens its quality. Finally, domestic banks and export industries voluntarily submit to a more solid lender of last resort, given that this is a tool to get closer, again with reference to the Cantillon effects, to any new uh, uh, money. So there is support uh, for accepting uh, a, a submission to a foreign dominant money producer from inside the economy. For the fractional reserve banks in particular, this means that they need uh, not keep reserves as high as before, and that therefore they can engage into further uh, credit expansion. What makes the monetary type of imperialism so, so much attractive, included for, uh, for the dominated, is that it implies the transfer of a single means of exploitation only, namely the monetary exploitation. And therefore, it appears as a tool for a bankrupt state to recover and keep control over the other means of exploitation, taxation and uh, regulation. Now, what are the institutional forums through which monetary imperialism uh, operates in reality? The prima facie example is that of outright replacement of uh, a failed money producer by a foreign money producer, dollarization, whether this is official or non-official in dollars or euros. Uh, but there is a more subtle way, uh, which is generally preferred, uh, and which allows uh, the, the ousted domestic central bank to, to nominally stay in place by keeping uh, its uh, bureaucratic existence and its name, even though its nature is transformed. And uh, these are uh, the so-called currency boards. Uh, what a currency board achieves is to, to keep the name of the previously existing medium of exchange, but to transform its nature from a, uh, a real, uh, fr from a money, uh, uh, self-standing money, into a money title, money substitute, uh, uh, convertible into a, a foreign money. And therefore, the currency board is a vehicle through which uh, a, a foreign uh, money producer can expand the territory on which uh, uh, it can practice a monetary exploitation. However, currency boards are quite unstable, not the least because they tend to accumulate significant foreign exchange reserves, and these foreign exchange reserves, of course, uh, are naturally tempting the domestic governments uh, to liquidate them, yeah? which would mean that they would just exchange these foreign uh, government IOUs for present-day uh, real go goods. Uh, however, currency boards have an extremely uh, a useful function uh, as they allow uh, the creation of monetary unions. The introduction of any new money uh, uh, faces the problem uh, of the regression theorem, and currency boards solved this problem, uh, especially uh, in, in, the, uh, in the case of the euro area, uh, in the way the euro uh, was created. Now, uh, so uh, there are many other examples of uh, cur currency boards nowadays. They were mostly adopted by the ex-communist countries. Uh, beyond the euro area, there is a, a, an example of the two French franc zones uh, in Africa, and there are many other projects that are uh, uh, under discussion. But I would like just in conclusion to focus on, uh, on the, the setup of the euro area, which as a matter of fact has been a, a real game changer. Uh, so according to official statistics published by the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund, uh, about 65 to 
and 25% of foreign exchange reserves are respectively held in US dollars and, uh, and in euros. And the relative stability of these uh, figures over the years suggests that the euro has effectively contributed to achieve precisely this quality unification uh, after which uh, fiat money producers are. And the cooperation has been so successful uh, that it allowed an almost doubling of uh, the growth rate of international forex reserves since the euro has been introduced. So thanks to, uh, to, the, euro, uh, to the introduction of the, uh, of the euro and to this uh, manifestation of, uh, of monetary imperialism through a reduction of the number of uh, money producers, uh, monetary exploitation has been de facto intensified uh, worldwide. So in a conclusion, uh, I believe this is a, really a tribute to, uh, to nation state and, uh, and economy because the analysis that Mises uh, uh, pursues there is focused on, uh, on collectivism and how collectivism uh, 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 leads to, uh, to conflicts. And what I tried to, uh, to, to do here, very sketchy, uh, is to show how uh, uh, state uh, collectivism in the production of money uh, creates uh, conflicts uh, international uh, of its own type that we can uh, label uh, monetary imperialism. And I do believe that this is uh, indeed an example of the enduring uh, uh, potency uh, and modernity of uh, Mises' analysis. Thank you. My paper is um, on the uh, discussion, that uh, very subtle and nuanced discussion that Mises has in, in nation, state, and economy about the relationships among liberalism, nationalism, and the right of self-determination. Um, he also makes some highly interesting remarks on immigration, but I don't know if I'm going to have time to, to get to that. Um, I've really boiled it down to about seven or eight points. Um, for Mises, nationalism was not antithetical to classical liberalism. Uh, in, in nations such as Germany and Italy, 19th century liberalism first emerged and expressed itself as a political movement in the form of what Mises called peaceful nationalism. It was based on two fundamental principles. First was the freedom from rule by foreign kings, or what was called then the right of self-determination of peoples. Second, uh, the second principle was the national unity or the nationality principle. The two principles were indissolubly, ind indissolubly linked. The primary goal of the liberal nationalist movements, um, Italian, Polish, Greek, German, was the liberation of their peoples from the despotic rule of kings and princes. Liberal re revolution against royal despotism necessarily took on a national, nationalist character for two reasons. First, many of the ro royal despots were foreign. For example, the Austrian ha Habsburgs and French Bourbons who, ruled, uh, Bourbons who ruled the Italians, and the Prussian king and Russian czar who subjugated the Poles. Secondly, and more important, political realism dictated, quote, what Mises says, is the necessity of establishing an alliance of the oppressed against the alliance of the oppressors, unquote, in order to achieve freedom and to preserve it against foreign oppressors. This alliance of the oppressed was founded on national unity based on common language, culture, heritage, customs, and literature. Even though uh, forged in wars of liberation, liberal nationalism was for Mises both peaceful and cosmopolitan. Not only did the separate national liberation movements view each other as brothers in their common struggle against royal absolutism, but they embraced the principles of economic liberalism, which unites all peoples in the international division of labor. They did understand this. Point number two, as a classical liberal, Mises emphasized that the right of self-determination is not a collective right, but an individual right. Quote, it is not the right of self-determination of a delimited national unit, but rather the right of the inhabitants of every territory to decide on the state to which they wish to belong, unquote. Mises also points out that for liberalism, the nationality principle, that men in the exercise of their right of self-determination as a rule, quote, vote in favor of the country where they all will not be, uh, be members of a linguistic minority is simply a fact. It's not a principle or moral law, law, unquote. Indeed, Mises makes it crystal clear that self-determination is an individual right that would have to be granted to, quote, every individual person if there were in any way 
if it were in, in any way possible. My third point, or Mises' third point, nations are natural social formations that exist apart from the state or states that govern them. Despite championing self-determination as an individual right, Mises recognized that the nation has a fundamental and relatively permanent being, independent of the state which may govern it at any given time. Thus he refers to the nation, quote, and, and this scares a lot of modern libertarians, uh, quote, an organic entity which can be neither increased nor reduced by changes in states, unquote. Accordingly, Mises characterizes a man's, comp what he calls compatriots, as those of his fellow men with whom he shares a common land and language and with whom he often forms an ethnic and spiritual community as well, unquote. So Mises is talking about a spiritual community, again, anathema to modern libertarians. Mises contends that nationalism is thus a natural outcome of and in complete harmony with individual rights. He states, the formation of liberal democratic states comprising all members of a national group was the result of the exercise of the right of, of self-determination, not its purpose. In other words, unlike, uh, let, let's say, German imperialists who are trying to get all the Germans together, whether they want to or not, into a single state, um, that's not what liberal nationalism was. It, it was. it was a choice among those who were oppressed by foreign despots to fight back and, and to unify themselves for purposes of defense. Should be emphasized here that in contrast to many libertarians today who view individuals as, as atomistic beings lacking emotional affinities and spiritual bonds with selected fellow human beings, Mises affirms the reality of the nation as an organic entity. For Mises, the nation comprises humans who perceive and act toward one another in a way that separates them from other groups of people based on the meaning and significance the compatriots attach to objective factors such as shared language, traditions, ancestry, and so on. Membership in a nation, no less than in a family, involves concrete acts of volition based on subjective perceptions and preferences with a background of objective historical circumstances. Okay, that was me talking, not Mises. Okay, so. Um, Mises' fourth point, or the fourth point that we can derive from uh, nation, state, and economy. Colonialism is, is the denial of the right of self-determination. Unlike many late 19th and early 20th century liberals, Mises was a passionate anti-colonialist. As a radical liberal, he recognized the universality of the right of self-determination and the nationality principle for all peoples and races. He wrote powerful and scathing indictments against the European subjugation and mistreatment of African and Asian peoples, and demanded a quick and complete dismantling of colonial regimes. It's worthwhile quoting Mises on this. And, and there are long, juicy quotes in, in um, the book about this. I'll just give you one. The basic idea of colonial policy was to take advantage of the military superiority of the white race over the members of other races. The Europeans set out, equipped with all the weapons and contrivances that their civilization placed at their disposal, to subjugate weaker peoples to rob them of their property and to enslave them. No chapter of history is steeped further in blood than the history of colonialism. Blood was shed uselessly and senselessly. Flourishing lands were laid waste, whole peoples destroyed and exterminated. European conquerors have brought arms and engines of destruction of all kinds to the colonies. At the point of the sword, they have set up colonial rule that in its sanguinary cruelty rivals the despotic system of the Bolsheviks. Unquote. In those areas where, where native peoples were strong enough to mount armed resistance to colonial despotism, Mises, who, like Rothbard, was very enthusiastic, um, he supported and cheered on the national liberation movements. It's very interesting. He says, uh, this is Mises, in Abyssinia, in Mexico, in the Caucasus, in Persia, in China, everywhere we see the imperialist aggressors in retreat, or at least already in great difficulties, unquote. So he was, he was gleeful about this. Um, as you can see, Murray, Murray was. Um, major okay, the fifth point, majoritarian democracy, even in states with liberal constitutions, results in the irreconcilable conflict between nationalities and the inevitable oppression of national minorities. Mises therefore maintains that two or more nations cannot um, peacefully coexist under a single democratic government. National minorities in a democracy are, are quote, completely politically powerless, unquote, because they have no chance of peacefully influencing the majority linguistic group. 
even where majority groups are proportionally representative, represented in the legislature, um, the national minority, quote, still remains excluded from collaboration in political life. Mises writes that even if the members of the minority nation, quote, according to the letter of the law, be a citizen with full rights, in truth, he's politically without rights, a second-class citizen, a pariah, unquote. In fact, M um, Mises characterizes majority rule as a form of colonialism from the point of view of, of, of a national minority living in a multilingual territory. For the minority nation, democracy, quote, is not popular rule, but foreign rule, and seems like oppression to the minority, where only the choice is open to oneself to suppress or be suppressed, be suppressed, one easily decides for the former, unquote. Mises was adamant in his view that democracy means oppression for the minority. He insists that for the minority, democracy is, quote, subjugation under the rule of others. And this, quote, holds true everywhere and so far for all times, unquote. And he dismisses the, the off-sided counterexample of Switzerland. Um, he says it's irrelevant. He says, uh, he says local self-rule was not disturbed by internal migrations between the different nationalities. Had, had significant migration established the presence of substantial national minorities in some of the Swiss cantons, so if you had intermingling, um, Mises says, quote, the national peace of Switzerland would already have vanished long ago. Uh, point six, economic interventionism aggravates the, the conflict between nationalities. And Mises points out that in interventionist states where education is compulsory, and quote, people's speaking different languages, live together side by side, and intermingled in polyglot confusion, unquote. Formal schooling is a source of, quote, spiritual coercion, unquote, and one means of oppressing nationalities. The very choice of the language of instruction can, quote, alienate children from the nationality to which their parents belong, and over the years determine the nationality of a whole area, unquote. And compulsory education is only one example of, of how interventionism exacerbates, doesn't, isn't the underlying cause, but exacerbates the inevitable conflict between different nationalities that are living together under a single state. Um, Mises uh, states, quote, every interference on the part of government in economic life can become, become a means of persecuting the members of nationalities speaking a different language from that of the ruling group. Okay, point number seven, e and this is very important, even under a, a, a laissez-faire system, the national minority will find ways to oppress the national minorities using the state. This is perhaps Mises' most important insight. He argues that even where government is rigorously, rigorously restricted to, quote, protecting and preserving life, liberty, property, and health of the individual citizen, unquote, the po political arena still degenerates into a battleground between the different nationalities residing within its geographical jurisdiction. Even the routine activities of the police and courts in this um, ideal liberal regime, again quoting Mises, can become dangerous in areas where any basis at all can be found for discriminating between one group and another in the conduct of official business, unquote. Mises gives the example of a judge who acts consciously or still more often unconsciously in a biased manner, unquote because he believes he is fulfilling a higher duty when he makes use of the powers and prerogatives of his office in the service of his own group. Uh, not only are the members of a national minority subjected to ingrained and routine bias in the political sphere, but, they, but because of deep cultural and ideological differences, they are often unable to grasp the thought and the ideology that shape political affairs. So the, uh, the, the result of the political impotence of the national minority uh, in even a liberal democracy, is that it perceives itself to be a conquered or colonized people. Um, as Mises puts it, uh, quote, the situation of having to belong to a state to which one does not wish to belong is no less onerous if it is the result of an election than if m one must endure it as a consequent of, consequence of military conquest. Uh, my, uh, the ninth point, uh, well, actually, I comment on this in, in my paper, and I say the in inevitable outcome of mixed nation states was a suppression of minorities by the majority nationality, a bitter struggle for control of the state apparatus, and the creation of mutual and self and deep-seated distrust and hatred. This state of, of affairs often culminated in state-sanctioned physical violence 
including the expropriation and expulsion and even the murder of minority populations. Okay, so the ninth point, and I think I'll stop after the ninth point. Do you know I have a few minutes? Okay. Only the full implementation of the liberal program will bring to an end uh, national conflicts. Almost alone among classical liberals of his era and modern libertarians, Mises clearly recognizes that laissez-faire capitalism and free trade are necessary but not sufficient to ensure peace among different groups of individuals forced to live under a single state who may naturally self-identify as different peoples or nations on the basis of language, shared customs, traditions, religions, heritage, or any other objective factor that is subjectively meaningful to them. Um, as Mises states, quote, all these disadvantages dis experienced by minorities are felt to be very oppressive even in a state with a liberal constitution in which the activity of the government is restricted to the protection of the life and property of the citizens but they become quite intolerable in an interventionist or socialist state. So they're not just the result of collectivism, the result of, of, of more than one nation or peoples that identify as different nations living under a single political regime or a single state. For Mises, the best that can be said of a government whose functions are strictly limited to protection of person and property and enforcement of contract is that it does not, quote, aggravate artificially the friction that must arise from the living together of different groups. It's for this reason that Mises defends compl the complete, what I call the complete liberal agenda, not only domestic laissez-faire, but the right of self-determination. Um, he does not believe that the violent antagonisms between nations living in a single political jurisdiction is due to uh, an, an innate antipathy between peoples. To the contrary, Mises points out that the, uh, despite the hatreds that may naturally exist between different groups of people of the same nationality, and he gives the example of Prussians and Bavarians here. I don't know what's, go what's going on there. Maybe Hans can enlighten us. But he says even though they, uh, there's these antipathies between them, they find a way to li live peacefully together uh, because they're of the same nationalities. Okay, so... Um, uh, Mises goes on to say they are able to get along peacefully when living under the jur jurisdiction of the same state. Uh, while different nationalities that are forcibly bound together under common political arrangements are in constant conflict. So it is, uh, it is not these natural antipathies between people, but the political denial of the right of self-determination that is the underlying cause of, nation, of national, and I would, I would say nationality conflicts. In this vein, Mises issued a, a dire and prescient warning, quote, as long as the liberal program is not completely carried out in the territories of mis mixed nationality, hatred between members of different nations must become ever, f ever fiercer and continue to ignite new wars and rebellions, unquote. So this is certainly true of today, right? Um, we live in a world, particularly in Asia and Africa, where European imperialists and colonialists force different tri nations, tribes, chiefdoms, linguistic groups, ethnicities, religions, into deeply dysfunctional political unions. Most of the 40 wars currently being waged on these continents are intrastate or civil wars. Uh, and as Global Security, uh, a website that tracks this, has said, most of these wars are fueled, quote, as much by racial, ethnic, or religious animosities as by ideological fervor. At their root, uh, unquote, at their root lie the attempts of minority groups to resist or end oppression by the majority by either seizing the, the existing state apparatus, seceding from the state, or creating a, a, a new state like ISIS has done. Okay. Um, and, uh, I'll, yeah, okay, so one last sentence. Um, I have a, a, a long section on what the, all this means for immigration, mass immigration, and Mises gives us a lot of good insights on this. Um, but basically what I'll say is that the universal right of self-determination and the breakup of existing states, and not the op artificial opening or closing of borders of existing states, is the proper solution to the conflict that we're seeing today among nationalities. Okay, thank you. Why is it you took two or three, or three of my, my, my pages? Oh, did I? Yeah. Or oh, somebody else took it already. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll recover that. Nikolai took it. And then Nikolai took everything. Oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's okay. Well, uh, in, in my paper, I deal with the thank, thank you, sir, with the political eco the political economy of uh, of nations. As we have learned from Professor Salerno's uh, Mises defines uh, nations as as a language community. <laughs> 
So and he makes a very important uh, contribution uh, to the, uh, uh, in fact, he pioneers this field because I'm not aware of any discussion of the, um, uh, the economic, uh, of, of the nature, uh, the, the causes, the consequences, the, uh, the growth, the decline, and the death of nations uh, before me. So he really uh, delivers elements uh, to such an analysis. And the four most important elements are uh, that the nations are not creatures of the state, uh, that nations result from individual uh, decisions, uh, that government interventions, um, uh, th that uh, nations are the, the consequence, but not necessarily the intended consequence of, of human action. And the fourth one is that interventions by governments to, glory in the, uh, to, to glorify the nation, so the, to increase the power of the nation and so on, usually have the contrary effect. So they are, they are not either necessary nor uh, efficient. So they bring about usually the, the contrary, right? Um, so we have here a, a very uh, a promising approach that is an extension uh, of the Mengarian uh, program to, to study uh, uh, larger collective holes in terms of uh, methodological individualism. So what I do in my paper is to criticize uh, Mises' um, approach to so certain limitations and then try how, uh, to show how they can overcome uh, uh, with a slightly modified uh, approach. So as far as I can see, there are three uh, uh, shortcomings or limitations in, in Mises' uh, approach. The first one is to um, equate na a nation with a language community. And that is a problem because um, uh, a community uh, very often is an intended community. So a community is not something that just occurs uh, uh, spontaneously, that is, uh, uh, is the result of human action but not of human design. A community as a rule is a consequence of design. Right, so people want to live together, want to be in a society or in a community and so on. Uh, is the, that's the first one. So language uh, uh, itself uh, is, is, uh, is an unintended consequence. Right? So uh, language is, is a consequence of community, but it's not preceding community. Of course, there are uh, mutual uh, reinforcements, and once the language is in place, then of course it modifies, colors uh, the further development of the community, but it's not the original cause. I mean, it's the original, I would say, the, the, really the, the nature of a, a community, of a nation. Uh, the second uh, shortcoming is that Mises um, compares government interventions uh, that seek to glorify uh, the nation, so increase uh, the power of the nation, to the ideals of 17. Uh, 89, right? So the ideas of the French Revolution. That, now let's uh, leave aside all uh, political questions, but uh, from a purely methodological point of view, that is a problem for an economist because what we do usually in economic analysis is we compare uh, uh, how things would occur under the respect of property rights on the one hand to what would happen if property rights are infringed, not respected, not enforced, and so on, on the other hand. And so the political economy means then the comparison of the two sets of consequences that result. Now Mises refers to the ideas of 1789, and uh, okay, among the ideas of uh, 1789, we have indeed the respect of property rights and so on, but that's not uh, the only thing. There's uh, two other things that he also mentions and which are crucial for his analysis, namely on the one hand, uh, democracy, and on the other hand, the idea of a free movement of people, goods, and capital. Now, as Hans uh, Hoppe has pointed out in uh, several publications dealing with uh, not only the, the problem of, of uh, migrations, is that um, this is very loose language uh, likely to induce us into error. In fact, if we look at free trade, free trade is not based on the principle of free movement of goods. Right? Goods do not move freely, they do not f float across uh, space or something like this, but uh, it's always uh, concrete persons who accept them uh, willingly. Right? So if I, uh, there, there's no banana that just floats into my, my fridge, but it's I who go to the shop or maybe I ask somebody to deliver a banana, but then I want to have it. And so then I put it into the fridge and, and so on. Right? So it's, 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 a, it's a decision. And so similarly, uh, so the problem in the uh, mainstream analysis of migration is, is just free movement of people. And indeed, people, if you don't let them, well, some of them, they roam freely uh, across, not only across national borders, but also come into your house and serve themselves, help themselves to your fridge and other things. Um, uh, and so in the case of migration, there too, right? There must, be, there must be ownership somewhere. Some people must be owners of, uh, of the land, must be owners of houses and so on. And so for the same reason, 
uh, for which we have uh, walls and houses and doors and houses, so we uh, decide whom we let in or not uh, let in. So for the same reason, it's also legitimate that we decide whom we let into uh, national borders and so on. So Mises does not have this. And that's, uh, that's of course, a problem if we are talking about um, the development of uh, national communities, however we, we define them. Uh, because if it's just a result of free movement, well, this free movement might actually not be a free market phenomenon. It might be an interventionist uh, phenomenon, right? In which case, it would be on the other side of the political economy analysis. Um, then I... I um, uh, in the case of language, right, the, the specific problem uh, related to so in, in the case of language is that uh, language as a rule, right, uh, as Mises himself observes, is the consequence of uh, government intervention, right? So uh, a common national language is typically not the natural consequence of people just living together, but it's very much a consequence of government intervention imposing this and that language in schools, in public schools, uh, repressing the use of other languages and so on. So um, the starting point is... Um, uh, vitiated or perverted, if you wish. It's a little bit as if you start the analysis of monetary systems by looking at uh, fiat money as a standard case. You can do this, but of course, if you do this, then you wouldn't notice certain consequences that follow from, uh, from fiat money, which you can only understand once you compare it to natural money, so to free market money, right? So here's the same thing, right? It's not perceived wrong to start your analysis with the... Uh, uh, phenomenon of a language community, but since the language community is itself is already the consequence of government intervention, so you you ha you don't have the, the standard of comparison, the free market uh, comparison, you don't have it. And the the, the third uh, limitation, uh, lacking element, is that Mises has really no theory of the decline and of the death of nations. Now that was not a, an, a current uh, actual problem in uh, 1919, but it is very much uh, <laughs> a, a, a problem for us today because. Uh, we have the, the death knell uh, uh, not only of German culture, but also European civilization in general, right? So, uh, clearly, if we just uh, have open borders and so on, we let everybody in, just uh, and we pursue the current destructive um, uh, interventionist policies, not only in migration, but in other fields as well, then, then clearly we are on the way to dest destroying uh, nations and uh, civilizations. Okay, so how to get uh, to a more realistic um, uh, analysis, uh, more realistic understanding of uh, of nation, and uh, then also to to different policy conclusions. Uh, in, so, in my past uh, construents, uh, I have tried to uh, base myself on the um, on a more general approach, right, which allows me to think of nations as being a particular instantiation, most notably an, an interventionist form of of, of community. Uh, next to many other forms, and free market forms most notably. The most general approach that I could think of uh, is based on Aristotle's uh, theory of friendship, which uh, Aristotle presents in uh, chapter 8 and following of uh, the ethics, the Nicomathian uh, ethics. So here Aristotle distinguishes three types of friendship. And friendship is, is relevant because friendship is really is the immediate cause of community. Right? If you have friends, well, then you have community. It's the definition, almost, say, of a community. So is the friendship based on pleasure? Games, drink, food, sex, and whatever. Uh, the uh, friendship based on utility, the business friendship, right? the, the, the friendship of the uh, people engaged in a, in a robber uh, a bank, uh, the, trade corporation and, and, and whatsoever, or of a state, right? Uh, and uh, the, the friendship based on shared virtues, okay? Now, from there on, we, we can develop this in, in, in different ways, right? And, and I don't have time now to, uh, to go into uh, much detail, but uh, are, these are the following points which I would uh, uh, underline, namely that uh, there is a certain... Um, uh, of course, in a, in a free uh, setting, you get overlapping communities, overlapping circles of friendship uh, that do not necessarily run around uh, the language barriers, around ethnic barriers, uh, and, and so on, right? So they, they, they are overlapping, overlapping circles of friendship. But then, of course, you get certain uh, uh, homogenization effects through the, um, uh, uh, the circumstance that certain... Um, um, uh, communities, 
develop, so they grow. They grow stronger or more quicker than others. Uh, uh, that is based on the fact that, that certain um, uh, uh, virtues are more conducive to uh, economic uh, flourishing uh, uh, than others. Respect of property rights, I mean, the, the usual thing, right? Respect of, of persons, uh, honesty, uh, and, and, and various other things. Uh, so these are uh, truly the foundation of, um, as we know, of a free market economy, and therefore make those community and those forms of friendship that are based on utility particularly efficient. Right? So the most fundamental, uh, most important form of, uh, of friendship is the friendship based on virtue. Uh, and uh, depending on um, uh, which, which kind of virtues and to which extent these virtues are really the basis of community, well, the, 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 the community in question then develops uh, economically stronger than others. And by, through this way, then in, indeed it exercises an attraction on many other people. So what are the causes then of uh, such communities? Uh, the, the, the two most uh, inform, uh, important causes is, well, is the transmission of the, the constitutive values or the constitutive uh, virtues which occurs most not notably through education. Right? So we have uh, uh, the family. Uh, it's interesting that the word nation, of course, derives from uh, uh, natus, right, from, from born, right? I mean, this, right? The, the community in which you are born, which raises you, is in fact the, the most important cause of your uh, membership, of your uh, adherence to uh, those values or those virtues that constitute truly the most uh, fundamental uh, community. And the other uh, form is adoption, or what we uh, today call some, sometimes assimilation, right? If you say oh, immigrants, they have to assimilate to the prevailing culture. I mean, there's really, they have to adopt our culture. And uh, in, in that uh, context, uh, uh, of course, we should always remind ourselves that we ourselves, of course, we have adopted uh, foreign cult cultures, right? In a way, we are all, uh, all Germans today are much more, in fact, Greek and Roman <laughs> we are Germans uh, of the, whatever, the, the first or second century before Christ. Right? Uh, and, and, and similar then, of course, for, uh, for, for other countries. So we, we, uh, you, you adopt those virtues and those values that are uh, first developed in other nations. And the Greeks themselves and the Romans themselves, of course, is the, 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 the French uh, uh, cultural historian uh, Rémi Brague, his books have, some of his books have been translated into English. It's a very nice book. Uh, uh, one, one book is it's the title uh, Via uh, Romana, so the Roman way. And he argues that the cultural uh, specific of the Romans was to be transmitters of culture that we received from elsewhere, namely from the Greeks. The Romans were very anxious not to be too original in their approach, as far as culture is concerned, but just to transmit what they had received from, from higher grounds. And interestingly, the Greeks themselves uh, distinguished themselves from all the peoples living in the Eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean by the fact that they were the most innovative, that is, the most ready to adopt foreign uh, practices, for example, Phoenician um, uh, alphabet, right? Or the idea, uh, the way the, the Phoenicians uh, approach the alphabet uh, in giving up their own customs, their own ways, uh, if it was less, uh, less conducive right, to, to, to their welfare. So we have birth, right, and so family, cultural transmission, and so and adoption on the other hand, and language is in fact very much a, as a, a consequence. It's a very much an unintended uh, consequence. Nobody plans in, in a free market setting to impose a, a, a current lang a common language. The common language results from the fact it's just the most uh, useful way to interact with with other people. Now. Uh, the political economy uh, element then uh, leads us to consider the phenomenon of fiat uh, communities. Right? So these are the uh, communities that are then uh, being formed under the impact of government interventionism, and in particular under the, the guise or the pretext of glorifying or increasing uh, the, the nation. Of course, like all government interventions, the, uh, the effective consequences are uh, usually the opposite of the desired result. Right? I mean, what um, fiat uh, communities do, or what government interventions do, typically is uh, to inflate, first of all, it's a, the short-run consequence is to inflate the, the object uh, in, on behalf of which uh, you act. Uh, right? uh, for example, if governments want to uh, uh, promote economic growth so they, they, they can spend more money and so on, in the short run, you can increase um, GDP figures, uh, and you can do this by consuming capital, and that's the dirty secret uh, behind this. 
So in the case of nation, of course, in the short run, government intervention the use of violence can increase the relative position of one community relative to others, uh, but at the expense of undermining the very causes that brought the community into being and into its present uh, state, right? So um, uh, the consequence always short run inflation, uh, but a loss of sub substance, a centralization uh, of the um, uh, organization of the uh, of, of the community and uh, dependence on the on the the center and ultimately uh, a decline. So I guess that this uh, uh, approach is is helpful in analyzing not only the conditions prevailing in 1919 but especially also in our current day, which was the main motivation for me writing this paper. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so now we have a, a, a question and answer time. We have about uh, 15 minutes left. I ask all my fellow uh, panelists to, to join me on the, on the stage. We have two mics to share, and you have all the questions to ask. Do you have questions? Uh, as an historian, there was sort of a monkey wrench in, into the discussion. Uh, but it, uh, may, maybe it's, it's Mises I'm criticizing uh, rather than the, the, the presenters. But it, it seems to me that kings played a vital role in creating nations. Uh, the French nation was to some extent created by kings uh, who forcibly eradicated or tried to eradicate provincial cultures uh, I think it was de Gaulle who made the, the remark that France was the product of 30 kings in 40 provinces, uh, but it was the kings who, <clears throat> who amalgamated them and forced them into a unified nation, even creating an Académie Française and doing other things <clears throat> to, create, to create nation. Uh, and the same thing can be shown in other countries, uh, so that uh, although Mises does not like what he sees as, as non-liberal democratic nationalism, in fact, national or, or nations as an historical phenomenon were very much dependent on pre-democratic or non-democratic forms of, uh, of control. The other point is I'm surprised that Mises did not notice that one of the most benevolent governments was in fact a monarchy, the Habsburg monarchy, uh, which was a multi, a, a, a polyglot uh, uh, empire uh, which on the whole was quite benevolent and at least in its declining years very much open to Austrian economics. Uh, the nation states which replaced it were generally vile, uh, in every way inferior to the Habsburg Empire. They were more repressive, they were less open to free market uh, economics, and they oppressed minorities much worse than the, in the Habsburg Empire. Um, so I, I'm wondering how we would address, how Mises would have addressed the, the fact that one of the, uh, 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 that a polyglot multinational empire uh, had in fact ruled his part of the world better than the nation states which succeeded it. I can give you something I didn't mention in my talk, but it's in my paper. Uh, and that is that he said uh, so that unlike German and Italian nationalism, <laughs> which was the, the sort of liberal national, right. nationalism, the nationalism of the Poles, the Czechs, and so on, was was a, a, a non-liberal. Uh, um, right. And, and, and he, he said that that unlike I mentioned in my talk, that he said that that um, the principle of nationality is, is, is a fact that is a people uh, self-identified part of the nation, but but with, with the Czechs and the Poles and a few a few other many other groups later on mm -hmm. in, in the nineteenth century, they wanted to. Um, force people within the borders of, of, of their nation to use their language. Mm -hmm. All the oppression um, that 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 means is life. So he, he, he said that's where liberal nationalism began to become aggressive nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and how the Germans, how well treated they were by the Czechs, and so on. So he didn't. He wasn't aware of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 he did he did recognize that. For you, Dr. Herzman, is like, uh, do you think the, based on what you said, do you think that libertarians are much closer to conservatives? Like, uh, I mean, uh, in uh, in the way they see the world, like one depends upon another, or because. 
I think about it and like, I tend to see that connection. And I think you were touching on some points like that. Like you cannot be a libertarian without like this moral ground of family and religion and stuff like that. I'd like you to comment on that if possible. Yeah, as far as causal analysis uh, is concerned, the case is crystal, uh, crystal clear, right? I mean, so it needs to uh, come uh, uh, from somewhere. And of course, I mean, there's also reason, right? I mean, uh, all ideas have sprung up in the course of time somehow, right? So uh, we're not handed down from anybody else or, there, or some individuals who came up with new ideas. But the matter of fact is that this process is very, very slow. So if we were to forget all political ideas uh, until tomorrow, then of course it would take uh, whatever hundreds of thousands of years until we we came back to the, the current state of, of the discussion, good or bad, right? Um, but I think, uh, of course, the, the libertarian uh, uh, looks at these things uh, from a very different point of view than the uh, than a conservative, right? A conservative uh, looks at community or tends to look at community as a desirable objective uh, to be preserved, to be achieved, and and so on. Whereas for a libertarian, uh, you're, not, you're more concerned about the process. You're more concerned about the, the liberty of action right, exercised within the rules of the game. And the important thing is then to, um, to have the right rules of, of, of the game, property rights, respect of property right, right definition, right forms of appropriation, and so on. Now, uh, both points of view are to some extent complementary. The libertarian can very much benefit from the um, uh, conservative as we can benefit also from, from socialists because it will also look only at results, right? Because sometimes if things are really uh, moving in a very bad direction, uh, if you just look from a purely, let's say, from an aesthetic point of view, it doesn't look right, right? Uh, you, you can have, a, for example, the popes do this all the time. Right? They look at the situation and it doesn't look right. I mean, you figure this out, right? And the current Pope is very adamant. Uh, he has these, has these left left wing uh, intuitions what the causes might be, and he uh, professes them loud. But really, I mean, this is just his personal opinion. In that but he says, well, look, there's something is not right, and that, that's helpful sometimes because you say, okay, is it really the case that all the rules are uh, respected as we would like them to see? Do we have the right rules? Right? Is uh, our property rights really in place, or is it not? Right. And indeed, right in, in, the, in the current situation, uh, we get the result of, of many decades of monetary interventionism, which produces massive inequality in income and, and in wealth. And unless you understand something about monetary interventionism and you, you see, well, I mean, central banks are just part of the free market, you would never guess this, right? Then you invariably come to the, the, to the conclusion, yes, it's capitalism that doesn't work. Right? Whereas if you say, okay, there's something wrong, maybe you come to the conclusion, yes, indeed, the, the, the problem, one of the problems, not the only one, one of the problems is monetary interventionism, monetary imperialism, and as a consequence, right, we, we get these, uh, the, these effects. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Have... To what extent was um, Mises' view of liberal nationalism influenced by uh, Ernest Renan? and his, his idea of the spirituality. We're talking about uh, the spirituality. And second, to what extent can we reconciliate Mises' view on, on, on the French Revolution to some extent as being uh, a, sort of a, 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 a positive view on the, on the French Revolution with respect to, to nationalism? And his idea at the same time that the nation is at the, uh, both based on objective factors and at the same time based upon the subjective meaningfulness according to the individuals of those, uh, of those objective factors. Because it seems to me that the French Revolution sort of redefines nation, which, which as Professor Hultzman uh, said, is, is a uh, proprietaristic concept, it comes from where you're born, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real concept, it's a real factor. And, and, and the French Revolution makes it as an ideological or, or, a, or a broad abstract concept that is used then to, to justify state action. So I was wondering to what extent is that uh, compatible with Mises' uh, analysis, these two views? Anyone on this? Okay. Well, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, I mean, he quotes Ernest Renan, right, in, in, in the book, right? He quotes Ernest Renan's uh, 1871 uh, 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 article. Uh, uh, just limit my, my, my uh, response to, uh, to, to Renan. Uh, Renan argues that, that a nation is a community defined by a common history and common projects, right? So it's not a language, not necessarily a language uh, community. It's something that has a common history, 
and we have common outlook, we have a common project. Of course, that's a very uh, uh, reductionist also view, right? Because it assimilates um, a com uh, all co uh, co uh, communities to some sort of a society. Uh, that you pursue a common goal. You have a common organization or something like this, right? Which is not characteristic of all. I mean, there are, of course, commercial societies most notably have this, right? Uh, political societies, parties, and so on, right? They have uh, objectives that they pursue and so on, but that's not characteristic of all uh, human communities, right? Uh, and then Renan, of course, him, uh, himself, I mean, the, the theory... Um, um, uh, is, is, uh, Hayek would probably call this a, it's a constructivist, constructivist uh, theory, right? I mean, first of all, uh, Renan was, of course, not very much concerned about uh, uh, applying this, this theory in Alsace-Lorraine after 1914. Right? Okay, he was dead, right? But he, was, <laughs> he was not concerned about applying this, this doctrine in, in Brittany, let's say, in the, in the 16th century, or in, in Africa, which uh, France had, had colonized after 18, 1830. Right, so there too, right? I mean, there's no community, no common history with the peoples there, no common project, uh, and, and and still, right? You you impose uh, French culture, French uh, language uh, on them, right? And so, so he really doesn't really discuss this. He just mentions Renan says, yeah. So there is one element, even in the late 19th century, in the 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 period of imperialism, there's one remnant or one uh, stroke of light of the old uh, liberal uh, worldview. Right? But the fact is, of course, that, that Renan's uh, theory is pretty much um, uh, self, uh, could be interpreted right? as, as a self-serving uh, vindication of French uh, rights pertaining to the population of Alsace-Lorraine, which had been annexed by, by, uh, by the Prussians, right? uh, with, with reference to this, uh, 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 to this theory, which um, is, um, again, right? Might be characteristic for this and that community, but not is not a general conception of what a nation is. Yeah. For uh, Professor Salerdo, if I understand well, what what you said is that Mises considered a self determination like a solution for a, a bad element of democracy that is the oppression yeah. of. Uh, ed, um, I'm a, a majority, uh, majority, majority uh, ethnic right. to a minority ethnic. So uh, maybe Mises was for democracy, but also saw a bad element of the, uh, of democracy, and then uh, he proposed self determination to compense that hero. Or that no, we're wrong. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, he Mises was a Democrat with a small D. He was very pro-democracy, and he was criticized um, by the old right here in the United States, like uh, Isabel Patterson and, and, and others, uh, for being so pro-democracy. And if you read his letters, they're, they're very naive about na the democracy. The letters that he, that he exchanged with some of the people on the old right, he didn't understand what their criticism was of, of democracy. But that aside, uh, what you're saying is correct. He saw the right of self-determination as f f resolving this problem, which was you know, inherent in, in, in polyglot areas. Or um, I, I think even, he didn't just define it as a nation. I, I think he saw it as, as, as more than just as a nation. I mean, he said a spiritual community, you know, and that, that implies a sharing of values and culture and heritage. Um, one, one point I want to make on terminology, uh, Mises used the word nationalism and distinguished between aggressive and um, liberal in, in nation, state, and economy. Uh, then later on, during World War II and after World War II, he dropped that. He dropped the idea of liberal nationalism, and he only talked about economic nationalism in the negative sense of protectionism. Um, the, and, and, and in fact, even in substance, there was a, a, um, uh, he had a plan for... Uh, uh, the reconstruction that he wrote during 1940s of Eastern Europe. It was very constructivist. He said, forget about the, the nationality principle um, will not work in Eastern Europe. So he, he wanted to have a, a, a very centralized government there in this plan. But of course, I mean, this was at, towards the end of the war. He was very depressed. And uh, so he seemed to have abandoned this. Um, and then he never really talked about it much after that. But, but one point I want to make about terminology is that, that um, there was a French 
and I don't know his name, but he's quoted in, in um, Guido Ruggieri's book, The History of European Liberalism, and he, he used the word national, nationalitaire, national, nationalitarians rather than nationalists. He thought that was a better word to describe what Mises was talking about, the nationalitarianism. In other words, na the nationality principle um, uh, was, you know, the, the voluntary principle of vo voluntary self-determination. Yeah, if um, assimilation is one of the causes of uh, building community, then uh, maybe to Dr. De Lorenzo, would that mean that the efforts to assimilate Native Americans in the United States, to take the Carlisle Indian School, would have been something that uh, would have been viewed as a positive, uh, as opposed to, of course, the wholesale slaughter of Native Americans? <laughs> How, how should we view assimilation efforts like that? Yeah, I'm always in favor of civil uh, assimilation over mass murder. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th I think something Guido said, you know, about when he's talking about culture, cultural assimilation. It reminded me of uh, Thomas Sowell wrote this book, Migrations and Cultures, big fat book, and one of the themes of it is that uh, is that. Uh, uh, people tend to adopt cultures that they think are superior to their own culture and uh, and dump their own culture. Like when the Europeans came to America, the Indians uh, uh, ditched their culture of hunting by foot and adopted the European culture of hunting on horseback. Frank, Frank he gives that example, obvious example. So see, I'm all in favor of assimilization over uh, mass murder. Yeah, any day, yeah. <laughs>